insights, solutions, and networking all come together at RSA Conference. Join a global cybersecurity community at rsaconference.com forward slash ITSP MAG24. Welcome to the ITSP Magazine Podcast Network. You're listening to a new Redefining Cybersecurity podcast with Sean Martin. Have you ever thought that we're selling cybersecurity insincerely, buying it indiscriminately, and deploying it ineffectively? Well, perhaps we are. Let's look at how we can organize a successful information security program that integrates business culture with people, process, and technology to drive growth and protect business value. Knowledge is power, now more than ever. Imperva is the cybersecurity leader whose mission is to protect data and all paths to it with a suite of integrated application and data security solutions. Learn more at imperva.com. Devo unlocks the full value of machine data for the world's most instrumented enterprises. The Devo Data Analytics Platform addresses the explosion in volume of machine data and the crushing demands of algorithms and automation. Learn more at devo.com. Hello, everybody. You are very welcome to a new episode of Redefining Cybersecurity here on the ITSP Magazine Podcast Network, more specifically, the CISO Circuit Series that I have the pleasure of uh, co-hosting with my good friend, uh, Michael Piacente. Michael, it's good to see you. You too. How you doing, Sean? Happy New Year. Uh, yes, Happy New Year. We get we got a couple out before uh, before the end of the year last year, and uh we're kicking kicking twenty four off with uh, with a bang today, and uh, we have two good topics we're going to talk about uh, with with a special guest who's done done quite a bit to uh, help the the community understand uh, what's going on with security, how to talk about it with each other, and uh, up and down the uh, the executive stack, if you will. So those are those are the kind of topics we're going to be digging into today, and uh, for everybody who knows th- this show is all about. Uh, communicating and operating security in support of a business that hopefully drives revenue as we protect it, but also does well for the community and society as a whole. So um, hopefully we get to some of those points today, Michael, a few words to remind everybody who you are, and then uh, I'll I'll leave the pleasure of introducing Don. People see Don there, uh, but people listening don't know that Don's on yet. So why don't don't you share a few words about what you're up to, Michael, and then, uh, do the honors, please. Yeah, sure. Um, Michael Piacenti, uh, managing partner and founder of uh, co-founder of Hitch Partners, where an executive, uh, kind of a curated executive search firm, focused in the cybersecurity leadership space, primarily CISOs and BISOs and deputies, um, where most people know us from. And um, yeah, what do we have going? It's a interesting year. We'll get into. We can always get into the market stuff, but uh, on on the initiative side, we have our. Uh, our fun uh, national uh, U.S. compensation and trends report coming out in about a month, I think, fe- late February. Um, so we're excited about that and uh, seeing what uh, what trends uh, persisted, what new trends exist. So um, it's a fun time of the year for us. A little bit of a crazy time, actually, as well, as many people went away for the holidays, uh, doing a little bit of soul searching on their career objectives uh companies as well um you have the sec uh, final rule went into place on december 18th so it's been a little bit of a perfect storm for us the last couple of weeks but uh, great to be here this is actually uh, definitely the best part of my day uh to come and speak with you fine gentlemen so um yeah without uh, further ado let me introduce uh, don bowen um and i'll go through how i know don as well but just a little bit about his background so don's a highly accomplished it and security technology leader um, award-winning as well. He um, he runs uh, uh, information security, compliance, and risk for a biotech startup called uh, Hound Labs. It's been there a few years and built it from scratch. Um, prior to that, uh, he built out um, uh, actually multiple functions uh, and a, a highly diverse team at Huntington Bank. Uh, for those who don't know Huntington Bank, it's uh, based in Columbus, Ohio. It's I think almost 200 billion in, in assets, and I think it's the 17th largest bank 
in the U.S. If I'm not uh, mistaken on those, Don, you can uh, you can correct me if I'm not. Uh, but he implemented um, a number of security programs uh, really designed to protect that enterprise um, from communications and systems and assets. So, uh, but interestingly enough, uh, even though Don has now been with a startup. Uh, has built that out, has built out a large financial institution. He also spent 30 years at the NSA, um, actually retired as a defense intelligence uh, senior executive, uh, working both offensive and, and uh, defensive cyber ops. Um, he had done a lot of things there, which I'll let him get into, all things I can't tell you because he'll kill me. But um, uh, he was also a, a cyber um, consultant for the US uh, Department of Energy for six years. Uh, Don's been super active in the community. Uh, he serves on the board for the NTSC, which Don graciously introduced me to and the, and the great team over there. Um, if you don't know the NTSC, definitely check them out. Very fascinating organization. Uh, he does a lot of uh, uh, non-for-profit and advisory boards um, and has a whole list of awards, um, which are incredibly impressive. I, and most of all, um, oh, and uh, we'll say that uh, Don's also kind of a double EE uh, MS from uh, Johns Hopkins and uh, bachelor's of EE from OSU. So go, go uh, Blue Jays, go uh, Hawkeyes. Um, and um, I, I met Don in uh, Columbus, Ohio, uh, like probably eight or nine years ago, um, which by the way, for random facts, uh, is also the birthplace of Hitch Partners, the Marriott in downtown <laughs> Columbus, Ohio. But we, we were co-hosting uh, one of our uh, CISO sanctuary dinners with a local VC there in Columbus. Don was part of that round table. Um, uh, you know, since then we have, uh, we've remained uh, in touch and just, um, he has an extraordinary story, um, but he's. I've also found on the OSG to be a strong and very pleasant advocating voice for the community. So I am super thrilled to have uh, him as a as a guest today. And uh, uh, thanks for being here, Don. Um, hopefully, I didn't mess that up too bad. <laughs> you didn't. Uh, an exceptionally kind introduction. I appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, I guess I'll give my really quick pitch around the National Technology Security Coalition, which is awesome. the NTSC organization that. That Michael talked about. Uh, it's really the voice of the CISO on Capitol Hill. I got in, involved with that organization, I think it was six or seven years or so ago, um, and have been on it since. Um, it's really CISOs who are trying to make sure that when nationally we put together legislation on cybersecurity, it makes sense and it can be implemented. And in fact, we've had a had, had fun and it's challenging sometimes, as, as any of you who work legislative types of things know. Um, getting anything through Capitol Hill is, is a challenge to begin with, but complex things like cybersecurity make it even more challenging. And you find out that both congressional leaders and staffs don't necessarily know what all those things mean. So when they start throwing out ideas about incident notification to the SEC or some other regulatory body, um, they aren't necessarily uh, practitioners, so they don't quite know what that means. And when we say, hey, you realize we deal with incidents of the CISOs day in and day out, sometimes with large organizations, huge volumes of incidents. So um, trying to put some sanity to that, it's a fun organization. Um, I get experience sitting down with congressional staffs and congressional members talking to them about cybersecurity issues, which is fascinating. Uh, but it's also a great group of individuals. Um, and, and quite frankly, from a peer group, you. You can't really uh, beat the, the group of folks in CISOs there. So that's NTSC. If you're interested, check it out, ntsc.org. Yeah. So, no, thanks for covering that. I've, I've had an amazing experience with Patrick and the crew over there. It's uh, They are absolutely incredible individuals, super interesting. And I learned a ton just in the short uh, ten, tenure that I've been helping out. So thank you. Yeah. And I, I, I'm i curious, Don, because, I mean, the – I read the the bio and there's so much stuff in there and, and Michael did a great job and kind of painting a picture for you. But I, I'd like a few words from you on, is there a defining moment in your career where you go, where you can say something big happened either to yourself, to the program, to the role of the CISO, to something that you can say, this, this changed the way we, we look at things today. Um, I, I'll make that one personal, I think. Um, and I think my answer to that question really is probably a change that happened in my government years in my career. Um, and I'll give you a few examples. Um, it's defining us and them properly. Because I think humans are, are classic. We're always, you know, there's always us, 
you know, our team and them. <clears throat> and I think early on in my career in the government, <clears throat> there was always some what I'll refer to as interagency rivalry, right? It's uh, we're the good agency, they're the bad agency kind of thing. Um, and sometimes you take that way too far. Uh, and if you define us and them properly, as I did, I would like to say the second half of my government career, um, then, you know, we're all on the same team. We're all working for the same government. We're all part of the United States. We should be pushing the same way. And we should be cooperating, not arguing with each other. Um, and honestly, I've, uh, I've used that same philosophy when I went to private industry. <clears throat> when I worked in a large bank, you know, it wasn't the uh, marketing won't let me, uh, you know, produce the following or this business segment is producing things without security checking in on it, stuff like that. <clears throat> you know, I ended up, you know, trying to help my team dis decide, you know, hey, they're not the enemy, right? They're, we're all on the same team here. Let's let's figure out a way through it and let's work through it. Um, and I think actually that philosophy, I think we're going to talk about a little bit here when we start talking about, you know, what sales and cybersecurity does and CISOs and cybersecurity do and how the two potentially can work together. And, and uh, we do need to work together a lot better on that. So I'd say that defining moment to me is really the when it kind of clicked with me and I went, hey, wait a minute, us and them. You know, there's lots of adversaries out there. Let's 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 make that them. Um, and, and the us piece is us all working together, figuring out a way through it. And we're going to disagree, but let's figure out a way through it. Yeah. Yeah, there are probably uh, countless examples we can pull on uh, each of us, the three, probably everybody listening as well. I mean, I can point back or look back to my days in, in engineering and quality assurance where QA was QA and engineering right? Or is it QA versus, right? Now it's security and, and, and app development, or is it security versus app development? I think we countless stories like that. And when I switched, uh, it's, it's very interesting you went there because my next, my next point that I wanted to bring up was kind of well, who, who are cybersecurity people selling to? And it, it's naturally, well, let's go to the CISO because of there at the top. But I've brought thousands and thousands, literally, of products to market. And as the companies I work with mature, they realize that there are multiple personas responsible Absolutely. for security. Yes, CISO sits there, but the CISO has peers. The CISO has a team. The CISO has a team that has peers. <laughs> and some are users, some are key stakeholders, some are the benefactors, some are the 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 teams that call it, that say that's a, he says is the, the guy who says no all the time. So talk to me a little bit about how cybersecurity salespeople approach selling into an organization. Because I, I often feel, like I said, that, that they start at the CISO and, and hope, hope it's your job then <laughs> to navigate stuff. Yeah, and the CISO is usually a tough person to get a hold of, right? It's a tough piece, person to pin down or... Um... And, and you're right, it, it, there are multiple avenues to go there, especially in a large organization. You know, when I worked at Huntington, we had, I don't know, 200 and some odd people in cybersecurity side of things. Um, quite frankly, selling to one of my, uh, one of the folks who worked for me in, you know, security engineering uh, or some other area was honestly just as valuable, if not more valuable, even though I had the power of the pen and it was my budget as the CISO. Right. They still had to go through me. They still had to get my seat, my signature. Uh, but, you know, quite frankly, if you could get their buy in and you poked on something that's actually a very valuable lesson for folks in the sales side of things. Um, if you can figure out a way to get a business segment in, a, in an organization and the security organization pushing the same way, again, back to that us and them, uh, if you get them both pushing the same way and both trying to uh, bring your product on board, you're even better. Right show that this all, you know, uh, obviously when I was with a, a bank, it was, you know, reduce fraud or do something in that side of things, something where you can tie something together there. You've got, you've got a business case that's unstoppable, right? Then it's you just, you differentiating yourself from other people who are out selling similar products. Um, so, you know, definitely uh, don't just consider the CISO, uh, but we're going to probably talk as, as we jump in here about kind of the do's and don'ts of, you know, what works or what doesn't work. I'm obviously going to give it to you from the CISO side of things. And I'll probably share with you what I refer to as my uh, 
my uh, uh, tales of shame uh, and several approaches that have come towards me. So we can go over that. But what I really like focusing on a little bit more is that, you know, here are the do's. Let's 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 all laugh at the don'ts because there are a bunch of them out there. But uh, then let's move on to the do's. And uh, I've actually given presentations before to entire sales organizations that are selling cybersecurity products to say, yeah, yeah, we've got to do this better. This partnership has to improve. So uh, let's, let's talk right. Yeah, let's, let's, say, let's, let's go ahead, let's go ahead and jump right into some of those, uh, if you don't mind. Um, and I guess the first thing I'll say is we really do need a healthy relationship here between sales and, and the CISO side of things, right? Let's figure out how to do that. But here's the important part I said in that, that key word in there is relationship. And we all know a relationship and, and getting your foot in the door with a CISO is difficult. Um, there's lots of different ways to do that, I would say. Uh, I can throw some of them out and things they need to think about, you know, get involved with the local community. Uh, the one thing I absolutely love about cybersecurity is we have a fantastic community and that community is, you know, in multiple different, whether you go to some of the security conferences, whether you're a member of some of the, you know, ISACA or ISSA or, you know, pick your SANS or pick your favorite kind of organization. They all are a great group of folks and they're all willing to help each other out. And I'll be honest with you, actually, when I left the government and went to a bank, the first thing I thought was, ah, uh, you know, I'll never, never, ever have a chance to actually pick up the phone and talk to my um, my competing bank's CISO. And the interesting thing was within a when the month of being on the job, I was picking up the phone and talking to somebody. And in fact, you know, there was a there was a shooting at another bank and I knew it was directly at their office. And I pick up the phone and I'm like, are you guys OK down there? You know. So it's very fascinating to me that we, although we may be competitors in a market space, uh, on the cybersecurity side of things, we're all one community. Sales and you know the folks who produce cybersecurity capabilities and defenses are just as much a part of that ecosystem as the CISO trying to defend things and their, their staff. Um, so we've got to make this work and we've got to make it work a lot better. Um, so you know, first of all, I'd say is establish that relationship. And everybody says, well, how do I get my foot in that door? I can tell you a few things that don't work, or at least don't work for me. And I think they generally don't work for most of the other CISOs. Um, you know, a lot of the cold calls and cold emails, you know, there's just because something pops up in my end. I mean, come on, we're all training people around phishing emails and everything else. You think just because you send an email into my inbox, you know, all right, yeah, way to go. I want to buy your capability. It's probably not going to get me to establish that relationship. And I'll be honest with you, some of the intro lines that try and get your attention. In fact, I got one this week that said, final warning. And I looked at it and went, oh, final warning. No. Yeah. Uh, I had to kind of laugh at that. And I did add it to my folder of emails of shame uh, because I actually use a bunch of them. I, I cut out the names and redact them so you can't actually see what organizations they came from. Uh, but it's my, uh, I put it on my presentations when I talk to sales folks. So cold calls, cold emails, they rarely work. Um, the voicemails often either don't get listened to or, you know, don't get return calls on that side of things. Um, you know, some of the other stuff that I've seen is patronizing emails. You know, I said the final warning one, but there are lots of other examples um, or, or the ones where we're trying to bribe. And, you know, CISOs and Michael can tell you and his uh, compensation survey will, uh, will prove that out. CISOs aren't generally low compensated individuals. So, you know, your $25 Starbucks gift card probably isn't going to go a long ways to swaying me to either take your call or look at your product. You might be in actually insulting me, right? Um, but I, I will tell you here, I'll flip the coin on you to say there are a few uh, folks that I've seen, and I will give credit to a peer of mine who does this. I won't name him, but the peer actually sets aside one day a month and he has a new, what he calls new tech day, right? And he allows vendors to, you know, schedule uh, a half an hour or an hour long call. And he actually has a fee for that. And what he makes you do though, is donate that money to a charity, a charity of his choice. I thought it was a great idea, right? It allows him to survey the landscape and, and understand what new technologies out there and things that he should be focused on, uh, but then also does a little good on the side there. Uh, gathering some funds from charity. So, you know, if you had that, if you had that, those sales dollars were burning a hole in your pocket and you wanted to give it to somebody, 
a great give them to a charity and it got your foot in the door and it might get you that second call back. Um, great opportunity on that yeah, side. I mean, we're seeing um, at RSA and Black Hat, we, um, I'm involved in a lot of the pitch for charities as well. And that's, that's a great, that's a great way to give back to the community and learn at the same time. Um, I love the fact that he's time blocking to do that. Uh, so kudos to him or her that's doing that. That's a, that's a great, um, that's a great methodology that, that others should take note of that. <laughs> so. Yeah. I even saw one that actually was a specifically, they were give to a local chapter of an information security organization that had a scholarship. Um, yeah. so I was like, that's awesome. You know, I, I might, I might actually look forward to several of those calls if you're, if you're actually going to donate into that scholarship side of things. Um, yeah, another quick don't, don't ambulance chase. We see that a lot in this industry, unfortunately. Uh, there's a lot of emails that go out right after, you know, the next breach is uh, publicized and they send out that email that says, if you had just had our capabilities, right, if they would have had it, they wouldn't have had this problem. Um, so, you know, that's, that's one of them that's just like, really? Yeah, I think, uh, um, I was going to make a point there, Don, because uh, I love, I love that point. Uh, I also will warn CISOs not to do that too. <laughs> so, that is true. Uh, well, any CISO that tries fear, uncertainty, and doubt and, and uses that fear as a motivator, yeah. that's not a very good senior executive, I'd say right there. You know, you need to get them yeah. past that fear. It's not even, uh, there's that point too. I, I, the other one I see, especially with so many CISOs looking for new opportunities is they'll see a breach that's public uh, and they'll call someone like me and say, what do you know about what's going on with the replacement? And it's like, you know, let's turn the tables for a minute. Like, if you were in that situation, would you want someone calling and knocking on the door? Like, let them figure through, and by the way, they've probably already figured it out if it's come out publicly anyway, but you know, not to pick on them, but I probably got no less than a hundred calls when Clorox went down um, about what's going on with the search, what's going on. And I, I wasn't even running the search, right? <laughs> so it was like, yeah. so I think everyone, human nature tells us that there's, you know, smoke, there's fire. Um, we're going to go find out about that. I think it's a great life, life lesson for anyone, um, sales folks and CISOs and anyone in between, uh, just not to ambulance chase because it's, uh, it's, not, it's not a good look and it usually doesn't result in any positive outcomes anyway. So I'm glad you brought it up. Yeah, I have seen on the on the positive side of this, I have seen when some of those breaches happen, I've seen the behind the scenes network with CISOs and security departments Absolutely. to say, say to each other, how can I help? Yeah, so that's how I do. Yeah. yeah. And can I, can I, you know, is there something, can I send a few people over who sit in your sock and monitor today's operations while you're focused on containing everything else? Um, and I, I've engaged in that a little bit myself. Of, uh, I won't mention names or, or places, but... Uh, after a breach, you know, picked up the phone call at the at the request of a of a mentor of mine to say, hey, can you talk to this uh, CISO and understand after a large breach how you guys are defending against this or what they should do? So, um, absolutely, those those are good. Um, and you know, there is a there is a positive lining there. Um, definitely, the I've, I've seen a lot of the you know I mentioned the gift cards, but the trinkets. Uh, I had a funny story when I was with Huntington that. Uh, vendor, and I don't even remember who it was, but they sent this huge box of these little tiny mini cupcakes. Um, interestingly enough, Huntington was real picky about how they did in, inbound mail. So I think those uh, cupcakes, which had uh, some, you know, gel packs or something trying to keep it cold, sat in our uh, mail facility for at least a week. Oh. Um, and I looked at it and it was one of these very fancy cupcake places, right? I'm, I'm looking at it going, he spent a lot of money on this. And then I'm, and then I'm like, well, they only gave me like two dozen of these little tiny cupcakes. And I'm like, I've got 200 people. How am I going to hand all these out to folks? And I'm like, I can't even hand them out because they're probably bad at this point. So, um, yeah, uh, don't bother with that. If you want to do something like that, um, here's my positive side of it. And here's the do's side of it. Um, if you do have started a relationship with an, a company or the security department or the CISO, um, I recommend you offer to sponsor a lunch and learn, right? That sometimes is a much more palatable way for folks to, to bring it in. You can spend your dollars there. Um, even I'll give bonus points to the company who does the soft sell of their product, right? It's not, you know, slides plastered with whatever it is, the company name and the company logo, but it's a let's talk about how people are implementing zero trust. And here are three or four vendors who do it. Yes, we're one of them, but here are three or four vendors who do it. 
and the differences in those types of capabilities, um, you will get a whole lot of more credibility and trust. And that was the second part of that relationship piece. I was going to, I mean, we're in the trust business, right? That's what cybersecurity is all about. And as a cybersecurity salesperson, you should really be establishing that trust as well. Um, and part of that is being um, open and honest that, yeah, there are three other four competitors. Here's how we do ours better, right? You're always going to want to differentiate yourself. But don't ignore the fact that there are lots of other competitors out there. Actually use that as to your advantage. Establish that relationship. Build that trust. And I want to I want to pause you there on that, Don, because Ellen, your thoughts on this, because I see a lot of salespeople move from vendor to vendor to vendor. And I see security leaders move from gig to gig to gig. And they kind of continue to find each other from wherever they, they are and wherever they land. And I have to believe that that's rooted in the trust, right? It is. Whatever, whatever you're selling, yeah. whatever you're selling, I trust you and we'll see how it fits. Here's what I need. I trust you. Help me. And maybe you work with some partner or some other, some other vendor, but so the, the trust is huge there, right? It is. Uh, I would say both the sales and the, the, uh, the sales engineers, uh, the ones that I've established a trust with are ones that will actually come back to me and say, I can't say this officially, but ours isn't the best product to buy for what you're trying to do right here. Right. Yes. They lost a sale right then, but they gained two or three more down the road because I knew I could go to them. You know, I was going to get it straight. They were going to tell me, and in fact, many times, even when I did buy their product, they'd say, all right, here's where, here are where the bumps in the road we're seeing from where we've implemented this at other customers. Um, you know, and one of the things I think I talked with Michael at one point about was, you know, having white papers and things like that out there are wonderful, right? You need to have those. As a salesperson, I don't expect in cybersecurity, I do not expect you to be the expert, right? Because you're not, right? You're the salesperson. I hope you have a sales engineer right behind you who's really good at what they're doing and can really delve a layer deeper um, into that, <clears throat> but also have things like white papers out there that discuss that. It, it not only describes your the environment and the ecosystem where your product goes into and hopefully places it appropriately in that ecosystem, uh, so it describes exactly where your, your solution fits. Uh, but also, you know, gives enough detail to say, hey, you guys really understand this space, right? You guys, you guys understand the, the challenges of it and everything else. It really establishes that, again, that trust uh, from a, hey, I trust that individual. I trust that company that they're telling me here's how it goes. Adds that bona fides that you understand things are going on there. Um, <clears throat> Is, do, you, do you look to the, the SE, the system engineer, sales engineer, for that, or do you find that some organizations have solution architects, security architects that can look at the organizational level, not just the operational? Level? Yeah, you're going to get a little bit of both. I'd say from both okay. sides, it's a little bit of a push and a pull. I've seen a lot of sales folks who come in and say, "Yeah, I'd like to spend 30 minutes with you, with you telling me, you know, what your current challenges are for 2024." I'm like, eh, I'm a security guy. I don't <laughs> typically go out saying, here's exactly the holes I have yeah. in my architecture and how I think I need to fill them. That's not a very good approach to that, right? You're going to get rebuffed or they're politely just going to throw you off with things, right? They're not going to give you the full, right, here's exactly where all my problems are. You know, can you fill these gaps? Can you fill these holes? Um, so definitely, I would say there's a little bit of push to pull. You know, If you have a large enough organization, uh, yeah, absolutely. I need to have folks on staff who understand where my gaps are and can ask all those questions. Um, but likewise, you need to have from a vendor side, you need to have that sales engineer who can meet them halfway and who can answer them honestly and say, yeah, you know, you're going to get this out of it, but you're not going to get that out of it. Yeah. And, and, and to put things in perspective, I mean, look, we're, we're entering uh, 2024 here. We're in, we're in 2024. Uh, 2023 arguably was one of the worst in cyber history as far as, you know, uh, the reality that hit <laughs> with the economy and everything else that went around it. But, you know, if, if you have a, if you have a new product or platform, or you were one of those 3,800 <laughs> security vendors out there, um, it's difficult to make inroads into this community. It is. Um, they're hard to get in touch with. Uh, they're completely overwhelmed. 
Um, and many companies are simply expanding their existing footprints and their existing platforms versus looking at new technologies. That's why it's great to hear stories of like, you know, new tech day, right? Uh, someone t taking time to time block for that. So bringing in a reputable uh, sales or customer engineering leader um, is, I think, critical. It's, it's where we see the most success. Um, it's also one of the areas of, or it's one of the, one of the reasons we're seeing such a huge increase in not only SEs, but kind of let's call it um, CISO-like figures um, and what we would call a field CISO or even a portfolio CISO. Um, and I think it's, it's a, it, it is a, a pretty loud and clear message to the, um, uh, to the community that, look, we have, we, we're going to need folks that, that definitely know how to speak uh, the language of the customer um, externally facing. It used to be when we first started the, uh, our firm, it was maybe 5% of the searches that we had had a sales component effort or uh, enablement um, scope uh, percentage. Uh, and now that that is definitely in the 25 to 30 percent. That's the externally facing. But you also need to know how to communicate with sales and other sales engineers as well. And and so I think this this cycle that we're seeing right now, this this massive explosion of field CISOs um, is really interesting. Um, and it really stems from all these products that are out there that are fairly complex. They're fairly point solutions. Maybe some of them have a robust platform. But um, this is here to stay. I mean, for any CISO that's wondering, should I be focused on a little bit of customer enablement? Yes, you should. <laughs> You're going to have to sell your own posture. You have to listen to other people's postures. You're going to have to do it all. So I'm glad they were talking about sales engineering. There's a bigger um, sort of gravitational pull that's going on here as well. Yeah. And, um, you know, one of the things that I would recommend for all those folks is be ready with referrals. Yeah. Um, and I would say that when I say be ready, I mean, already have them in hand when you walk in to go sell your product, right? Because, you know, we've already mentioned that behind the scenes, CISO to CISO side of things, right? We all talk, we all communicate with each other. And trust me, I'm constantly, we, I get messages from all of my peer group that says, hey, is anybody using this? I, I get them through the ISACs, right? People were like, mm -hmm. hey, uh, anybody else using this capability? Can you tell me how easy it was to implement? Um, you know, things like that. So if you're ready with white papers and referrals, those referrals to say this other customer it has implemented our solution, right? Obviously you wanna stilt it. They've had a good experience with it, right? They've implemented, it's successful and they're willing to talk to you. And then it's a, you know, a peer to peer talking about, hey, we implemented it, it was, you know, it was seamless, it worked great. Here are a few things to think through, you know, there's nothing's ever 100% rosy, right? We all know that. Um, so it's okay, you know, be ready for those types of things. Have those referrals up front. So ask your customers after you've done a good install in places and somebody you don't mind being to some extent a proxy spokesman for your product, um, ask them if they'd be willing to take a call from somebody else considering buying. Yeah, um, there's there's no shortcut, right? I think that's that's what you're trying to say. It's like, there's yeah. no silver bullet. There's no. I mean, I I'm so old that I remember the sales guys in my original storage, uh, enterprise storage company getting leads off the fax machines, right? So, <laughs> so I won't I won't go into how embarrassingly old that is, but uh, you know, mid '90s, that's what you did, right? And um, yeah. there was, you still had to build that relationship. You still had to figure out a way to earn that trust, to show value, to understand their problems. Uh, and and that's it's tough. It's tough in this environment. It's much more crowded. Um, uh, the CISOs are much better blockers. Um, they are really it's, what people don't realize is that CISOs are extremely extraordinarily good uh, at blocking out the noise. Um, extraordinarily, that they watched CIOs do it for so long, <laughs> and they're like, we can teach a master's class in that now, right? And so um, so yeah, you have to figure out how to get through. It's not easy. For sure. Yeah, I, I'd have to do those things or I'd spend my whole day yeah. weeding out, you know, what's what's this? What do I need to deal with versus what are all these emails versus the phone calls versus the, everything else? There's there's no way you can survive. You'd, you'd waste no. a lot of time um, to your point, I guess, kind of to tie a bow on this. I would absolutely say it's back to that relationship, building the trust. You are in a marathon here. This is not a quick sprint, right? To build that relationship, to build that trust. It's going to take a little bit of time. Um, use your peer group, get involved in the community so that you're not just a face that's out there hawking a product. You're somebody who really cares about this. You're somebody who's invested in it. Um, I've seen a ton of that. And quite frankly, I'd go to those folks first 
when I'm looking for a solution. I want, I want to ask you, Don, um, how, how much do you expect somebody coming to you? How much do you expect that they know about you and your organization, your operation, um, as well as the potential threats that you face? Because I've seen many, many a pitch deck that, I don't know, the first five plus slides are setting the stage for the problem, which every time I see that, I figure people like you know that already. Yeah, right? yeah. And Don't then, spend then a lot of time on that. Yeah. Then there's yeah. the transition to we're going to guess at what that looks like in your environment. So I, I want to understand wh what what you expect in that kind of phase. There. Yeah, I, I think two techniques are, are, are effective for that. One is uh, every uh, sale, cybersecurity salesperson should have a one pager, I know this is gonna be difficult to get past the marketing department, but a one pager that speaks in plain English of exactly what your product is and what it does and what type of place, you know, what architectures it fits into. Um, work hard to get that through and approved, uh, right? With less buzzwords, right? We're all tired of hearing them. Get rid of all of that and show me a diagram and give me outline on it does the following things. I'll be happy. Um, the second part of that, I would say, is uh, give examples in the industry. Sorry. So if you're trying to sell to financial services, say here's, you know, because you don't know how, you know, if I'm, if I'm cold calling Huntington or I'm cold calling some other bank, I don't know what their architecture is, right, as a salesperson. Um, you'd be a lot better off to say, here's how we think this fits into the financial sector. Here's how we think it fits into health, right? And those types of things. So you come with your pitch deck, which is predominantly focused upon those industries. Because, you know, there are clearly differences in how they've implemented things, systems they have, how they operate. But in general, you know, they've all got kind of the same types of problems and the same types of issues, especially if they're a regulated industry, uh, because that'll drive them kind of to some common architecture and some, some common things there. So those are the two things that I would give you that really help out with that. That one pager that's plain English without the word salad, because we're horrible. And I'd say that on both sides, right? CISOs, gosh, yeah. I lived in the I lived in the government for 30 years. I thought I knew acronyms, right? Because the government was a master at it. And then I exited and went to a bank and I'm like, holy cow, you guys are worse. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, this is amazing. You guys have come up with your own, yeah, AML BSA and <laughs> Thanks, I, I, the acronym. I'm glad you brought that up, Don. And, and part of my role here in these sessions is, um, you know, advocating, but also, uh, I guess, pushing the CISO community to also think about things on their side. And I'm glad you brought up the word salad. I don't know how many resumes I've looked at just this week that had a grouping in the middle of every technology that uh, the CISO has um, they've been exposed to, right? Um, uh, we're not going to go through each one and figure out the depth, uh, nor should any company do that during the interview process. But one for vendors specifically, you know, I might recommend because you are going to need this for interviewing at some point is for CISOs to also come up with a one pager as to what, you know, nothing confidential, but just, you know, uh, products that they use or technologies they use um, in each of the in each parts of the stack, in each part of security operations and application security and compliance, uh, because it'll make the conversations a lot more efficient with vendors, with partners. Um, when you get to your interview, you don't have to explain when did I use Palo Alto Networks versus CrowdStrike. You know, it's just it's too hard. Um, and and also the audience doesn't really understand it as much, right? So you're trying to explain a technology that you use in one area, um, and it's it's actually you know a platform you use for all the areas. Um, that's difficult to explain in a two minute session. So. Just you know, for CISOs to be more um, more concise about that as well will will help this uh, become a more um, efficient process overall, in my opinion. And I've seen a few of them do that already, um, which is which is great. Yeah, and, and please, I hope whoever's watching this, and if you're in sales, I hope you don't think I'm bashing on the sales, <laughs> the cybersecurity sales industry. Um, I just think, quite frankly, on both sides of this fence, we can both do better. Yeah. Us and them. Us and them. Let, let's shift. We have. A few minutes left, and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll we save some bashing for the board. <laughs> I think. I'm, I'm joking, of course. Nice but um, so the so now you, you're you're speaking to your peers. Well, we can extend it to the ELT executive leadership team if we want, um, but focus in on the board. How does a CISO 
I mean, you're, we're talking about technologies and controls and audits and all this mm -hmm. stuff and talking to salespeople and reading emails. And then the other end of the spectrum, translating all of that to a board. <laughs> so yeah. let, let's, let's go to, let's go there now. Yeah, there's some common pieces there though. And again, it's, I think goes back to, it's uh, about building a relationship to some extent. Um, if you can, you right, if you have that opportunity, uh, I've been lucky uh, to work at a few places where I could establish a relationship with the board. First and foremost, though, even if you can't establish that relationship, know who you're working with, right? Know who's on your board. Uh, research their bios. Know where they've worked before. Boy, I, I would focus in on it as a CISO, uh, and I'd look at the board members and like, all right, which one of these people has been a CIO before, right? That's that's somebody I want to pay attention to. They know the tech side of things. They're going to be asking me some tough questions. And I want to make sure I satisfy all of their questions on that. Because uh, you do probably on a board especially have a wide variety. There's a long, big spectrum uh, of folks, you know, and, and all, all of them probably very smart people. But some of them are fo more focused on finance. Some of them more focused on sales and marketing. Uh, some of them clearly focused on the tech side of things. And as a CISO, you want to pay attention to those committees that you'll have to to be part of, or you'll have to, to give presentations to, whether it's a tech committee or a risk committee, those types of folks. So you want to make sure you know who's on that uh, committee or who's on the board so you can understand where they're coming from when they ask you those questions. Um, do your homework, right? Um, you're probably not going to find out a lot on board members from LinkedIn, uh, but generally your company will give you bios on each and every one of those. I actually worked for a company at one point that actually uh, you know, sent you to dinner with the board as the CISO. So you had a chance to sit down and eat a meal with these folks and they get to know you beyond the, hey, yeah, I'm going to grill you <laughs> during the committee session. I'm going to ask you lots of questions. Uh, but, you know, they wanted to understand a little bit more about you. Um, it's a little bit more about building that relationship and again, building the trust. Um, so please do that. Um, if you can meet outside of a board meeting and get to know them a little bit better, do that. Uh, that's definitely within whatever the tolerance of the company that you're working for. You have to kind of ferret that out yourself on that side. I've actually worked before with folks where the board members, they had my cell phone. They'd call me. In fact, that's how I got that call at one point to say, hey, could you talk to this other CISO over there? I'm on another board and they're having problems. Could you talk to them about, you know, what's going on over there and maybe offering some some uh, assistance or, or ideas? Yeah, that I'll echo that uh, real briefly in, in that, um, you know, as a CISO, uh, if you're reporting to the board or you hope to be a board member um, as a CISO someday, I mean, that you have to remember why why the relationship needs to exist there, right? You are by far and away probably the most effective uh, uh, translator of risk to business terms in the organization, right? They know that. Um, you have an unselfish approach to narrating that risk and on behalf of the company. And, um, and the better veteran for the company, you're, you're a good listener, right? You look for solutions. Um, if you understand the, the, the core principles of why the relationship should exist, um, then you'll find uh, genuine ways to build relationships with those individuals um, and offering uh, time every month on, <laughs> on text or cell phone as to why, you know, and how you can help through these situations. You are the brought in as the expert to tell them what, what they need to know as board members a very different view of the organization they're not in the day-to-day -day. you are um, but you have to balance that com that communication so we've talked about communication of board a lot um, in this session and others but um, i think people lose sight of that uh, quite often is that it really is about that relationship um start, to your point uh, very very important. yeah yeah the one word of caution i will i will give uh, cso's in that <clears throat> establishing that relationship is you know, you do need to make sure your current leadership and, and different companies have different reporting structures for CISOs. You know, I've worked before where it was probably two or three people between me and the CEO. And then I've worked for companies where I work for the CEO as the CISO. Um, all those folks between you and that board need to be comfortable with you having an open dialogue and an open line of communication between that, right? So that's another area I would just say you need to pay attention to and make sure that they're comfortable with it, right? If you work in an organization that where you have four layers between you and the board and every board meeting, they make you go through a process by every one of those levels, reviews your slides and edits, edits it before it gets to the board. 
you probably don't want to have a super open dialogue uh, with those board members, right? Direct line of communication. They clearly have giving you the signal that they want the ability to shape that message when it goes to the board. So just a word of caution. Um, a couple other things though, that, that I think actually mirror what we talked about on the sales side of things, avoid the, avoid the jargon, the cybersecurity jargon. Um, I think Michael, you mentioned it before about translating that risk uh, for board level. Um, you need to also be able to translate sometimes some of these very difficult technical conversations um, and cybersecurity concepts to a board who may not have that background. Um, always try, and you know, I know we get kind of in our own headspace as CISOs, always try to make it about the business though. Put it in business context. Um, if at all possible, you know, I, I really wish, you know, we get to the maturity on the cybersecurity side where we are true, boiling it down to dollars and cents. Um, you know, even if it's a, you know, if we're not a profit center, even if we're an expense on that side, that's one way to look at it. You're an expense, right? Um, what are we spending? But you need to be able to translate that from a risk perspective. Yeah, here are the risks we're mitigating. You know, here, here, here. You know, and you have to, you have to describe those sometimes to the board so they understand. Yeah, you know, your manufacturing line is entirely computer controlled. It's automated, and we want to make sure that network and those systems don't get infiltrated with malware or ransomware because you'll be down and you've already done the homework. You know what a day down in that plant looks like, right? And you can easily translate that to them to say, here's what it is in dollars and cents. Um, yeah, I, I, I will say um, just from my, my view, that this is one area that I would give CISOs a pat on the back for um, in that uh, it's the one thing I feel the business has not really given enough credit to CISOs given the historical context here. So in the last five to eight years, and I'm a history major, so I was always look at it from that way, but it, it is very unlikely to find another group of, of, of individuals, especially executive, technical executives that have come so far in where their scope started. I mean, let's remember where this all started not too long ago and where we are today from a scope and the response, like everything has changed. The complete, the, the role has completely done a 180, right? As far as where it was and where it is now. I think CISOs have done a really nice job. Um, they're not perfect for, by any stretch, but they've done a really nice job actually um, codifying that risk, putting it into digestible format for the board to really take action on. Uh, sure, tons of improvement needs to be made, but given that they had very little time and very little direction and mentorship, uh, I mean, find me the percentage of companies that actually mentor their CISOs from an executive programming perspective, it's super small. Um, so I think they've done a really nice job um, and they're on the right path. So I do want to recognize them for that. I think CISOs get a lot of crap for not for not being a great board facing role. And like, well, let's look at other ones and compare it. Uh, look at look other executives and compare it. I think the CISOs have done a pretty fine job in that. Yeah. And, and are on and the right short path. time period. Very and short. Very period short time. Because yeah. I kind of liken it to, you know, we used to be as CISOs, we were technology executives, right? We were exactly. Kind of like a, a CIO or, or somebody in that space. Uh, one of their peers, and and quite frankly, where I think we need to head, and and some have made that, but I think it's slowly transitioning to the business executive. You're just exactly. a business executive with a very different portfolio than some of your product lines that are at a, at a business. So you know, I think if you communicate communicate well, especially around events that happen and board notification for those, always make sure you're involving your legal counsel. Make it about the facts. Uh, work on your metrics because really that's what boards want to see. They want to digest that. And usually most boards get a deck well before the meeting and they're trolling through it. You want to make that as digestible and understandable without your voice track as possible. Yeah. So it's, and we're the, really um, evolving and I think we're making good progress, but we got a little yeah. ways to go still. On the metric side, Don, I, I guess, um, not to put you on the spot, do you, but do you have a favorite metric to measure or something that you uh, like to talk to the board about that really kind of hits home uh, in your experience? Well, I'll tell you, the one the one they always focus on is events. You know, if you can digest those down into cybersecurity events or something like that. Do I think it's entirely useful? I think it's only useful in, in one avenue is, you know, if you've done a good job of putting together your threat matrix, right, which talks about all the threats you believe are going to come out for your business, uh, then usually your events that happen probably uh, give credibility to a lot of those things you had on your threat matrix. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they want to know, well, wait a minute, how many events? What happened? Are those growing over time? You know, how did we deal with them? 
who all did we bring in? And, and the one thing I think a lot of boards will press you on is, wait a minute, did you escalate that to the appropriate level, right? Did it go to the CEO? Did it go to the board if that was necessary, right? And of course now, and you mentioned it, I think, or, or, or Sean mentioned at the beginning of the call with some of the new uh, government regulation side of things, you know, that's incredibly important to make sure we're doing right. And I, and I wanted to ask you, Don, about anticipation <laughs> because board members talk to each other, right? And CISOs talk to each other. So, so there's a, the community on both, both sides of that. And when the, when the board's talking to each other, they're hearing about, to your point, a breach, some event hitting, uh, some threats or attacks hitting a particular industry. And you may or may not be aware of that. So can you anticipate some of those things coming? And then you, you might also you get questions, questions of, well, how do we compare to others in our, in our uh, sector? And that's where mm -hmm. I think maybe some of your community stuff might come in handy. So it's around anticipation. Do you, do you, how do you anticipate and how do you prepare for some of those things that aren't part of your deck, but are most yeah. likely going to come up? <laughs> As a CISO, you should be absolutely prepared for whatever the headline was, right? Uh, that said, so and so got breached. You know, how how did it happen? Those types of things. Uh, and most CISOs generally are pretty aware of that because, quite frankly, they're probably just like me. As soon as that happens, uh, I'm doing my. Uh, I hate to say my own version of ambulance chasing, but I'm doing the. You know, I feel bad for them. I hope that didn't happen. And by all means, I think sometimes we get away from the fact that we're all victims of this and we start victim shaming. But I won't go there. Um, I think you need, we as CISOs need to understand how did this happen, right? What were the vectors? Who was the threat actor? Can I make, can I learn from this so that I can avoid it myself? Um, those board members are trying to do the same thing. They may not formulate it in the same words, but they want to know, wait a minute, they got breached over here. Could that happen to us, right? What, what were the problems? So you need to be absolutely prepared for, especially the big name ones, the large ones. They don't, they probably aren't going to, you know, if it hits CNBC, um, you're, you're, you know, you're probably going to have to answer to it on that side of things. So I would absolutely be prepared there for those. Um, you will get some off the wall questions too, as well. Um, and the one thing I've always focused on, which I don't think most companies do well is cybersecurity of board members, right? Mm -hmm. Generally we give them crappy applications that aren't controlled by your, the rest of your business stack. Um, we need to do better in that space too, as well, I would say. Uh, just a, just a few bits of in, uh, sensitive information in, in those board apps. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah, just a little bit. Uh, um, and that, by the way, th th this whole concept again, a, an additional scope uh, that was not here just six, seven, eight years ago, which is the you know the focus of the CISO being the chief look around the corner officer. <laughs> so, I mean, their main job is to articulate a very clear and digestible story around. Uh, aiming, you know, to make sure you're protecting your customers, your data and your employees. But it also is what are the vulnerabilities coming? And they expect you to know that answer, um, whatever they is, whatever is on their mind, whatever AI uh, story they're reading in the paper that day. Yep. Or, uh, there was just a massive announcement on you know, LifeLock. I saw um, of all these records taken in the black market. So, I mean, we should be prepared. I, I have to be prepared for that. And I'm not a CISO. So <laughs> I, I Absolutely. totally yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I, I think, again, again, I think we've come a long way. Um, I think we have a lot of, uh, you know, there aren't a ton of, of CISOs out there, uh, but I think the ones that we have out there, the experienced ones really have come a long way and they are that business executive now who's having mature dialogue and discussion. They are some, to some extent, translating for their boards. Um, yeah. I think we need to get better. You know, a whole nother topic that maybe is another day is, you know, CISOs on boards because you're starting to see that with some of the legislation. And, uh, but that's another topic, I guess. Yeah, I agree, though. I, I think overall, I think uh, it's been it's actually been uh, a relief to see uh, that most boards are actually surprised about how well versed the CISO is on the business side. Um, I rarely hear uh, they're, they're hesitant because there's a reputation that comes with a CISO. Um, but once they start interacting with several on their board, um, they, they are very surprised, uh, often pleasantly surprised about how well versed they are and how well of a business um, leader they are versus just someone that's looking at code analysis and endpoint <laughs> issues. Right. So yeah. I think that's a good thing. I think we're well on our way. Uh, we're, we're, we paved and, it be, and honestly, Don, it's because of 
good folks like you in the industry that have uh, really been that mentor uh, and many others that have kind of led to that, uh, you know, led to that, that channel. So thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yep. And I, I think that that's a great point to say one more. Well, maybe two more. Thank yous. Thank you, Don, <laughs> for, for sharing your insights here. And thank you, Michael, for, uh, for co-hosting and, and bringing Don, uh, wrong Don to us here to, to have some fun. Uh, definitely tons of points for CISOs to, uh, to take with them and absorb and salespeople as well. And hopefully there's some boards members listening too, <laughs> so they know what the CISO has to deal with as they're approaching them and, uh, maybe even invite a few CISOs out that, uh, from the, from the companies that they represent as a board member. So, um, Michael, final thoughts? You want to close this out? No, just thanks for having me. Everyone have a safe uh, new year uh, and uh, be good to one. Get, be good to yourselves. That's all. I'm, that's my advice for today. <laughs> so There you go. Perfect. Well, thanks, Don. Thanks, Michael. Thanks, everybody, for listening and watching. Of course, uh, many more coming from Michael and I on the CISO Circuit Series here on uh, Redefining Cybersecurity Podcast. And uh, please do subscribe, share, and uh and comments if you have thoughts. Uh, what, do you, what do you think of all of Don's points and my stupid comments and, uh, and Michael's insights on uh, what, it, what it means to get hired as a good CISO. So thanks everybody. See you on the next one. Thank you. Devo unlocks the full value of machine data for the world's most instrumented enterprises. The Devo Data Analytics Platform addresses the explosion in volume of machine data and the crushing demands of algorithms and automation. Learn more at Devo.com. Imperva is the cybersecurity leader whose mission is to protect data and all paths to it with a suite of integrated application and data security solutions. Learn more at Imperva.com. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Redefining Cybersecurity with Sean Martin, part of the ITSP Magazine Podcast Network. If you learned something new and this conversation made you think, then share this show and ITSPMagazine.com with your friends, family, and colleagues. If you represent a company and wish to connect your brand with our conversations, you can sponsor one or more of our podcast channels. We hope you will come back for more stories and follow us on our journey. You can always find us at the intersection of technology, cybersecurity, and society. Insights, solutions, and networking all come together at RSA Conference. Join a global cybersecurity community at rsaconference.com forward slash ITSP MAG 24.